Once again, my name is Fardad. I'll be taking care of your OP244. Don't bother pronouncing my last name. I can't do it myself. Uh, so, uh, and the uh, very first thing I'm going to do, I, I'm going to apologize for murdering your names. I will do that, and I'm sorry, because it's like it's Canada. Nobody is in the same culture of the other person. It's the na natural thing over here, so it's very difficult to pronounce names. I apologize for that if I uh, misspelled your name. And I'm very bad with names, so it's going to take 50 times for me to remember someone's name, so my apologies. Uh, uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, object orientation, and uh, we are essentially teaching object orientation using C++ language. This is OP244, right? I'm not in IPC, okay. <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, so uh, I, um, um, I have to first tell you how do I conduct my class, and then we're going to go through the details of everything that we're going to do about the semester, how the things are going to go, uh, what are your responsibilities, mine, and uh, um, if by, the, by judging the other class for the last 15, 20 minutes, we're going to kicking into the actual lecture that we are going to talk about. Um, so, yeah, my name is Fardad. I've been doing this for forever, since 96, I think, 20-something years, okay? So, uh, my mother tongue is C++. That's, uh, what, I, that's what I speak in. Uh, and uh, I lead the uh, 244, uh, the second semester core, um, computer programming things, uh, OP244 thingy. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, how I want to do the class usually is, uh, it's always difficult to start a semester to be able to kind of break the ice. Uh, I do not like the prof-student relationship thingy that usually they have. Please don't call me sir, call me Fardad. I would really appreciate it. I'm already old. Sir makes me like 10 years older. I don't want to feel that way. So Fardad is fine. Um, so I'll try to uh, maintain a friendship between me and my students when we are through the classes and, the, and everything. And I'll try to help you that way. And we'll, you're going to see how the class is going to be. I'll try to act like a clone. I try to clown. I try to... Um, say jokes, although I'm not a very good stand-up comedian, so uh, it's not going to work all the time, but I'll try to kind of take the edge of the boresome of, of computer programming, because it is boring to teach it. I, I don't deny it. It's pleasurable to write a program when you know what you're doing. When you actually learn how to program, it's the most enjoying thing, because you are essentially having that dumb as a doorknob device in front of you that doesn't know what the heck it's doing. And you have to somehow, with some broken language, tell it what to do. And if you miss a little comma here or there, everything gets screwed up. So it's very difficult to talk to that device. But when you learn how to do that, it's very pleasurable because it can do wondrous things like driving a car autonomously, something like that. So you can do stuff like that. So yeah, so we'll try to keep this friendship. But for that, and um, because it's, it's been a, we had two pandemics happening. One was COVID, the other one was plagiarism, okay? So uh, COVID, thankfully for all the scientists, we uh, took care of it. But plagiarism is something that we have to take care of it afterwards because people are still in the habit of it. So for this relationship to work, the friendship thing, it's like you have a good friend, 10 years you're friends with each other, and he cheats on you. You don't like that, right? It's the same thing with me, OK? I'll try to help you in any way I can to successfully pass this course. By success, I don't mean to get a good mark. I mean to learn and get a good mark, OK? I'll try to do that. That's my promise to you. But in return, I want you to be an honorable student. Um, to fix that problem, I don't know what happened over there. Uh, to uh, try to kind of uh, make sure that things are uh, the way they are supposed to be, cheating is allowed in my class. 
which means <laughs> it's not cheating when you actually cite it. It's how we program these days. The era of one person in their basement sitting at a computer writing a program and make millions out of it is gone. Uh, the things that the programming languages and things that you do are so complicated right now that you need teams of tens of people and many departments to work on a single application to make it work. Um, because of that, we have to all work together, collaborate, learn to work with each other. Therefore, I'll give you your assignments, your workshops, and all the things that you have, although they are things that you have to do on your own, but I understand with working 20 hours per week to make the ends meet and at the same time study and take care of you two little children is not an easy thing to do for those who are, have more responsibilities and for those who um, are more freer, good for you. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying is that um, you can, if you are uh, at a critical time and you couldn't finish something and a piece of your code doesn't work, it's very okay to get the code from one of your friends. It doesn't matter at all, as long as you cite it. Okay, so what happens is that like you see a, a, one of your functions not working, you have a memory leak or something, somebody helps you uh, and says, okay, this, look, this is, you did wrong, this is how you do it. You look at it, you don't have time to learn it, you just put it over there and you cite it at the top of the thing that from this line to that line, this function, I got it from Jack. And first of all, I say thank you to Jack for helping you. And you lose like that 5% mark for that. So instead of 100, you get 95%. OK? That's what's going to be. Um, so that's how I mark it. So if, but if you don't cite it, then I am one of those people who have zero tolerance on it. So my apologies. Again, I'm not a bad person. I just want to make sure that it's fair between all of us. Those who study and work hard, they try to get a good mark. I don't want their A to be the same of an A of a person who copied all the assignments from someone else. It is not fair, OK? For the amount of you work that you do, you need to get the proper mark. So again, if you need, and also, if you give your code to someone else, you have to mention that I gave my code as help to that, that person. So if that person fails to cite it, you're not going to be uh, at fault. Okay? So if somebody asks you for help and you're going to say, okay, this is my piece of code, then you're going to say, okay, I, this piece of code, I gave it to John. And, and that's it. So if John doesn't cite you and the program picks your uh, uh, workshops as similar, and I put the side by side, and I see you said that I gave my code to John, but John didn't say, John is cheated, you didn't. Okay? So remember all these things. And all these things are mentioned at the top of every single assignment that I give you. Okay? Uh, we have uh, uh, quizzes weekly, we have workshops weekly. Uh, we have a project at the second half of the semester. Uh, we have a total of 16 deliverables for your workshops. So you have a total of 10 workshops, okay? The first, the, wor the six workshops that you do at the beginning of the semester, which is the first half of the semester, they have two parts. The first part is, uh, we call it uh, lab, but it doesn't mean that you have to start it in, you should start it in lab. It means you, uh, uh, start it at home and bring your problems with lab, okay? So it's kind of complete it in lab, or if you, don't, if you don't complete it in lab, it doesn't matter if you complete it earlier, fine. But uh, the, the lab part is extremely guided. So essentially, you follow the instructions of the lab and you successfully do it, okay? That's the, the lab part. The second part, and each one is 50%, so there is no difference. And the, the second part is the DIY part, which we give you what we want, you use the concepts you used for the first part, and you do it yourself any way you want, OK? And that's another 50%. And you reflect about all these things. The reflection doesn't gain you mark, but if you don't do it, it costs you, OK? So if you reflect on something, thank you. If you don't, you lose 40% of the mark, OK, of both parts. Careful. Okay, so reflection is very important because we read that and from there we get feedback to what to do. 
Uh, and also, if uh, uh, yeah, it, it tells us how the class is doing. And and don't be don't be yet yeah, in this thing. I learned that this. Talk about your problems. Like this part was part hard. That thing I didn't get. This thing wasn't explained properly. Things like that. I had difficulty on this one because the topic was not covered properly in class. Things like that. Don't worry. I'm not going to get grudges, take grudges, and do anything. I mean, yeah, I really want that feedback. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's that. The second half, if you have four workshops after the thing, but they don't have a DIY. They, have, they only have the lab part. So there is no DIY. You only have a lab part and a reflection. That's it. Uh, you don't have a DIY. Why? Because that's the time that the project kicks in. So try, we try to release the project uh, during the study break or before the study break. Um, and the project is going to have the total of five milestones. So um, the first four milestones are essentially uh, creating. So the, your, mile, your, your project is a fully functional application that you are going to write. Obviously, uh, we'll try to make simplify it like, I don't know, creating a point of sale, for example. So uh, you go to a grocery store, you want to buy stuff, they beep and the, so I, wanna, I want you to write that program. So I give you four milestones. Those four milestones prepares the engines and everything that the program needs to do. And in milestone five, you use all the tools you created to create the application. The first four milestones, they have 10% mark each, OK? And uh, they, are they have a very uh, soft due date. So we give you a due date, and we ask you to seriously stick to it. But even if you are a week late, you get the full mark for it. There is no partial mark or late mark for it. If you hand it in within a week after its due date, you still get the 10% for it. Um, but if, don't, if you don't do that, then you, get, you don't get any mark for it, but you still have to submit it because there are things tested in those four milestones that are not tested in the last one. Uh, I don't want you to overwhelm you with a huge tester program that you have to enter 900 things over there to test everything, and then halfway through you make a mistake, you have to start all over again. Because of that, we do everything little by little. So that's that. And after those five, five, four milestones is done, you, do, you submit your fifth milestone. And the fifth milestone is the application. Now, the application has, usually I try to come up with six different features that application has, or six different parts that application has. And I ask you to submit those six in six different steps. Therefore, if you don't complete your project, you still get a mark. So you get your four milestones, and you only submit one part of six, you get 50% of the project. You submit two of them, you get 60. You have three of them, you get 70. And you keep going like that up to 100%. If um, last semester, I had only very few people who uh, didn't submit all the six parts. Usually, it's easier. And it, because it's in six different steps, it's much easier and very short uh, things that you have to answer. Again, because you already passed the first four milestones, testing and stuff on that is going to be very easy. So that's the project. Uh, lectures and labs. Um, as you know, we have two sessions per week. One of them is lecture, as we are here. Another one is the lab. And in the lab, if, I, if, we, if we are to date to our lectures, we'll use the lab as just help. And if not, then lab is going to be used half and half, like half of it lecture, the other half lab. Um, what else? Uh, the recording that I'm doing, don't trust it. Things go like, right now you saw the screen went blue and came back. I don't know if the recording stopped now. <laughs> so don't trust it. It's only for review purposes, OK? It's not guaranteed it's going to be there. I'm not obligated to do that. You're supposed to take notes. Uh, but anyways, if, uh, um, if everything goes OK, I'll post the recordings one by one as it goes in our uh, uh, home page. And I'm going to show you exactly where it is. Uh, what else? Office hours. I set an office hours it's on my schedule. I'll show you all the things you'll see. You know you're going to see exactly where my schedule is. The office hours that are there are the time that I am present to help you. It's impossible for me not to be there. 
if I cannot get to my office hours, I'll cancel them via email. I'm telling you that, hey, my office hours are can uh, canceled and I can't. Any other day, any other time, I'm open for helping too. It doesn't matter. So, but what you need to do one thing. You need to install MS Teams, the application, not the web version. Install Microsoft Teams on your computers because that's the way I help you. You need to do two things. That was an easy one. The second one is a difficult one that is workshop zero you're supposed to do, okay? So workshop zero is only here. Don't talk about it with the other classes. They have no idea what it is. Only the sections that I teach do workshop zero, okay? Um, and uh, you're gonna thank me on that later on, I'll tell you. Anyways, so yeah, so through Microsoft Teams, if you just go on the calendar and you go to the uh, scheduling assistant, so if you want to actually set, an, set, set uh, uh, this is my schedule over here that, that, I, that I am busy. All the times that I am not, you can simply set uh, a time and book an appointment with me, okay? So these are all in Microsoft Teams, okay? I'll demonstrate to you later, and you can play with it, you'll see. Uh, you set a meeting, you click over here, set a meeting, it op opens and you s it says scheduling assistant. You say who, who I want to be in the meeting. Let's say two of you want to talk with me. Uh, uh, it opens up and you put the name of your friend and me over there. Uh, and then what you do, you say, uh, and it shows the, my schedule and his schedule and your schedule. And then you can find em uh, empty spots free between us. You set that one and you say meeting and I get a notification. If I can attend, I will say I will. If not, I will say, okay, this time I can't. How about half an hour later? Something like that. Okay, so, so keep that in mind. That's how it's going to happen, and all my help is happening on Microsoft Teams. I don't do one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't make sense. With Microsoft Teams, you have your screen in front of you. I have my screen in front of you. I share my screen with you. You'll see exactly what I did, everything. You can even record it, go back to it, listen to it, and we have much better ways to go through it that I'll explain. So it is much more efficient. Sit one by one, sitting side by side, me looking at you, doing this doesn't do anything. It's not going to help with this. Some parts of online teaching is beneficial. Some parts of it are not. Lectures, I'd rather do this because I can look at your faces and see who's actually looking at their computer and who's actually listening to me. Which brings me to your computers. Science proves that your computer does zero to help you learn while lecture is happening. It is only a point of distraction, and that's the proof. Okay? So, so you look at your screen, you type, you, you're not listening to me. If you want to actually do something that helps you learn, bring a piece of paper, take notes. You can throw that notes away, it doesn't matter. But as long as you listen to me and you write it down, you are actually submitting it to your long-term memory. This doesn't do anything, okay? Just letting you know. If you think you're doing something, you don't. And if I catch one of you smiling at your screen, everybody loses their laptops, okay? If I see you go <laughs> to your screen, <laughs> it means that I, okay, all right? So, all right. Many of you, no C++ better than me. If that's the case, it's not, you, you don't have to come to my classes, okay? If you think you know everything perfectly and you can do whatever you are doing, fine, okay? But if you are coming to the class, respect the class, okay? That's all I'm asking, okay? If you think that you can do it without anything, uh, and uh, the things are uh, a breeze, the, uh, all, everything's a breeze for you, please, the, uh, I, Better for me, less people, easier to teach. Hello. No problem. Don't be sorry, my friend. We all have problems and we're all late sometimes. All right. So that's that. Back to uh, Teams. Uh, you received an email with all these things. So midterm is going to be, uh, oh, yeah, for project. You know that the submitter program has some options that you can add afterwards. If you just type submit and hit enter, it shows you all the options. You can skip spaces when your spaces don't match. Your output, 
doesn't match with the spaces, you go skip spaces. It still submits it. If your linings are not, line numbers are not correct, you can say skip lines, or you can do both. If the submission is not, is not still open, you can do dash feedback. So it goes through all the submissions without submitting it to see if your work is done properly or not. So, and dash do is one of the most important things because depending on when the lab is, different sections have different due dates with, for the workshop. So, uh, uh, do dash do to see what the workshop or, or project or whatever milestone is due. And dash do shows exactly what the due date is for every single thing. Same thing for the project. Oh. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I have to see how bad it is. If I see it's just one space, I'll drop at like 10% to 20 maybe. But if I see it's like gobbledygook, then probably you get half a mark. It's very like uh, um, there's something that after a long time I've started teaching this semester IPC 144. I just wanted to know what the heck is happening over there. I just want to go back and see. So this semester I started doing IPC 144 again. And um, one of the things that I, and I'm going to is 1140 is my first class. And I got goosebumps. I haven't done it for a long time. So one of the things that I, uh, that I uh, always tell to the students who are beginners is that um, uh, computer programming is an exact science, OK? Although it doesn't matter for you if you put the plate at the proper place in the kitchen, and then you can put it back later, nothing happens. You can't do that with computer. When you do computer programming, everything has to be exact for your program to worth anything. If you miss a dot, a million dollar application could worth, be worth nothing. You can literally crash the plane if you print a semicolon instead of a column. Crash a plane with 200 people in it. Okay, so it's not a joke. Computer programming is an exact science. When you say three spaces, it's three spaces, not a tab. You follow what I'm saying? It is extremely important to appreciate that and then go about it, okay? So that's the reason that I'm so picky about it. But uh, anyway. Uh, and again, computers are not smart things. They're dumb as a doorknob. Remember that, OK? That's one of the most important things that you need to realize. In case of emergency, if there is no internet, you can't send me email and stuff like that, make sure you give me a call if you cannot come for a test or something before the test or immediately after whatever you are in that you couldn't come. So I can uh, have an exception for that assessment for you. Okay, so that's very important. I put the phone number and everything, contact information, so you have it. So that's that. Uh, and sorry if I sound a little congested. I had a cold 20 days ago, and the residues are still here for some reason. So I'm not sick. It's just this. <clears throat> My apologies. <sighs> what do I want to talk about? We want to talk about workshop zero. So we are NAA, correct? OK, so the announcements and everything are there. So this is exactly what you had over the, the potatoes, potatoes. It's, you saw that in Microsoft. Oh, don't send me email. I don't want to look, read my email, OK? Because your email is going to be between 955 emails that I receive every day. Use Microsoft Teams. If you want to talk to me or anything, send me a private message, over, OK? And put at for that, and then you, you, it, I'll, I'll get notified. And I see at the top that chat has messages yes sure. it's it, there's a minimum so so let's put it half like don't put less than half an hour because yeah. I mean like if, if you unless you want to see 
how I am and the other one. Like, <laughs> I'll wait for a thank you. <laughs> No, half an hour, your meetings are supposed to be half an hour. And if it drags more than that, then I'll see if I have time. Otherwise, we're going to postpone it to another day. And I don't have any time. So at night, when I cannot, so, thank you. Something else I have to mention. Respect the dot. Respect the dot. If I can bring the dot up. Respect the dot. If it's red or do not disturb, don't call me. And the phone number that you're calling calls Microsoft Teams. Okay? It doesn't matter. If your phone call, call me. It doesn't matter. I'll, if it's on do not disturb and I see a number, I'm just going to hang up. But don't call me if you see that thing is that thing is busy. If it is away or green, call me. Okay? So um, uh, maybe I'm downstairs or the other room, the computer is over there and if I hear it, I run to it and I answer. Or if, I'm, if, I, if I see it, there's a missed call, I'll call you back, OK? Um, either with your phone or on Microsoft Teams. It's better to use Microsoft Teams so we can chat. Um, but uh, yeah, so check the data whether and you And there is, I don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you see if, if it's green or away, call me. I don't care. No, I'll tell you why. Because I'll turn the speaker off at night. But when I'm working at home at 10 o'clock, I'm doing something, your call to me is a break. So it's not bad. I'm happy. You call me, I say, okay, I have a change of mood. Okay, so it doesn't matter. If, as long as I'm available, look at my availability, see if I'm available, call me. It doesn't matter. But those two hours that I have in my schedule, I will be at the computer waiting for you to call. Okay? Mm, other than that, book an appointment. Okay, for those two hours, you don't need to book an appointment. And it's very much possible that in those two hours, you call me and I'm going to say, I'm in, I'm in call with someone else, I'll call you back. Okay, because everybody calls at that time, right? I'll, to promise to be always available and to be actually be available are two different things. <laughs> okay, uh, I love to do that. Okay, but. Life comes uh, and things go wrong and my availability becomes more or less all the time. So it's not a consistent thing. Again, call me and if I see I have a missed call, I give you a call. I, I'm not going to, so give me a day or two to respond if you see if I'm respond. If I'm not responding, it means something. I am very busy, I can't. But um, um, anyways, yeah. So if you see it, like, because I see like, students call me and two hours later they send me an email like, I called you and it's two hours past, you didn't answer me. I'm like, come on, you know, it's not like that. You have to, you have to give me some time. Anyways, just give me, uh, give me some time to reply to your. But email should be for logging. Okay, if you want to send an email, send, put a timestamp on a message, send me an email. If you want to document a message you are sending to me, send me an email. Emails, I don't check much. Okay, I'll check weekly probably. Okay, so uh, that's very important. Anyways, back to the yeah. So faculty information is all over here. So as soon as uh, if so, please install Microsoft Teams. And if you anywhere that it says Office, you click on it, it's going to redirect to the to the office on on Microsoft Teams. So you know where I am, OK? Even on my schedule, on the web or in here, it doesn't make any difference. You click on it, it's going to bring that up. Uh, check the, uh, so the announcements, we already talked about it. Weekly schedule is here. Now, this is the two hours that I mentioned, OK? And I might change it. This is because it takes me an hour and a half to get home. OK, so by the time I get to IPC and I'm done and I drive home and I get over there, uh, so, it's, uh, I may change this if I see it doesn't work, but it's some, probably on Wednesday. But Wednesday is my development day that I do all the workshops and everything. Usually I don't put stuff. And if you look at it, if you look at the, uh, the calendar when you look at it, it's, it's, it's tentative. You see that? It's like, uh, it's not straight line. It means book an appointment, but most likely I'm going to say I'm not available. Because that day I'm going to do all the workshop for all the sections and 
uh, project design and stuff like that takes a long time. One day of, of uh, schedule. Uh, yeah, so um, the notes, uh, I am moving it to OER this semester. So you're gonna, so next semester is hopefully it's gonna be like IPC 144 where the website is not within the Seneca domain. But now if you click over here, it takes you to some kind of an HTML page as you see. Okay? And if you are at school, you can get to it. But if you are at home, you have to get connected to the VPN. Everybody knows what VPN, right? The global protecting E, right? You know that. That's that. But because I know that you may not be able to be connect, connected to VPN and you want to study uh, in the organization of OOP244 on GitHub, I put downloadable version of all these things too. Which brings us to OOP244 organization on GitHub. So this is the downloadable, as you see. Else, if you click over here, week one, two, yada, 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 and if you click on any of them, there's a zip file, so it says this is the one. Oh, I brought the wrong thing because the two things have the same, so let's go to say four. There you go over here, encapsulation. And so you click on that, it unzips a directory, so it puts all the images and everything and the HTML file, so you can have it downloaded on your computer, uh, clone it on your computer, and you can send it. So that's that. Where you're going to spend most of your time is here. OP244, NAA, and ZAA notes. Uh, that's where everything's going to be. Anything I do in class immediately goes over there. Take a look. Uh, last semester, I did an IPC144 review for OP244s. So we had like a crash course. We started at 9 o'clock in the morning. We went up to 6 o'clock in the afternoon, like nine hours of lecture back to back on IPC 144. I reviewed everything. So students kind of freshen up and they kind of fit in the blanks, the parts that you missed. So the recordings are there and all the code that I have written in class. So if you click on IPC 144 review over here, um, it's a good idea. And a Sunday, sit over here and just go through. This is these are the codes that I have written throughout through the class, all the codes that I have written. Uh, and uh, if you go back over here, here's uh, the recordings. So this is part one, part two, and uh, it is in big blue button. Let me see if make sure that it's link is yeah it is there. Okay, so that's that. What else in here I need to mention? So let's talk about workshop zero, something that I hope that you started already, OK? Now, workshop zero is a series of stuff to set up your computer. Skip the parts that you already have, uh, so you don't need to do those things. And uh, uh, so installing Visual Studio, if you don't have it, install it. Uh, Git installation, if you have a Mac, you already have Git. If you don't, install it. It tells you how. Install it. Putty installation. Make sure you have Putty and nothing else. Don't use the, any kind of SSH terminal client. Use Putty because I'm using Putty, and therefore uh, the communication between some each uh, telnet client that connects remotely to a Linux server sends different types of protocol back and forth, and that changes the characters sometimes. So use Putty so we all working it the same way. And it's a very low weight, extremely efficient uh, uh, SSH client. So please use that. So who knows what is Git? Don't be shy. I want to see how many of you actually know what Git is. Yeah, it's a version control, but what it is? Like, like, like I'm going to say, what is a drill? You're going to tell me it's a tool. 
I know it's a tool. What does it do? It makes a hole. You have to, so you know, uh, so I have two people. Okay. Okay, so who knows what is iCloud? Who knows what is OneDrive? The class doesn't respond. Okay, people. <laughs> I want you to answer the questions. Who, do, if you don't know what e one, OneDrive is and iCloud is, we are in trouble. Okay, you know what these things are, right? They, these are like like virtual drives that you have on somewhere in the internet. Uh, they call it cloud, but essentially it means somebody has a server somewhere that connected to internet. You can put your files in there, and you can download your files when you want. Are we all okay with this? Are we okay with this? All right. There's this guy called Linus Torvald. Anybody knows who's this guy? The guy who knows Git definitely knows. <laughs> this is the guy who created Linux literally in his basement on a computer, okay? And it is the largest open source project in the world and the most reliable operating system ever, okay? It has so many people contributing to it, to the code, that it became very difficult to manage all the code coming in to, to make this operating system better. So Linus, what he did, he created another application just to manage all these collaboration for all the code that is shared. That is called Git. Okay? So what Git is, is exactly like OneDrive or iCloud, but it's like, have you heard like Big Brother's always watching? Okay? It's something like that. Git is standing over there. Any file that you commit to it, it looks to it. Always always remembers what you have done to that file every single step of the time. So you can look at the file, do something, and commit, say, going to lunch, go, and come back, and then do another part of code, and commit again, go back. Every commit that you do is a snapshot of everything that you have at that moment, and you can come back to it later on if you want. If you write some piece of code and you say, shoot, I did it wrong. I wish I had the code the way it was three days ago. You can. You can simply say, revert to 355 on Friday. Poof, it goes back. If you did a commit at that time. Not only that, I can share the repository. You can share your repository with me and add me as a collaborator. And you write your code. You have a mistake and you have problem. You tell me for that. I, I have a problem. You call me on Microsoft Teams, and I'm going to say, what is your repository path? You send the repository path, the URL to me through Teams. I open it up because I'm a collaborator. I'll get your code, download your code. That's called a pool. Okay, when you pull in Git, pool means download. It's a smart download. It only downloads changes. Like IPC 144, you don't keep downloading everything to get one workshop. If I make a change, you simply do a pull, and only changes are downloaded. So you do a copy of the repository once, and every other time that I add something new, you do a pull, and it simply brings new stuff in. You don't have to redo it. So what happens? I'll look at your code. Right in front of you, I'll fix your code. I commit my changes, and I push. Push means upload and I push the changes to GitHub. Then all you need to do is a pull. You do a pull and tell to Git what are the changes. Git puts two windows, left and right, what it was and what it is, and shows exactly what was changed. So you can actually know what I have done to fix it exactly. And that's what you are going to reflect about. So that's the price of me, the price you have to pay for me to fix your code. When I fix your code, you do a diff, you take a look, you reflect about the changes I made to your code and made it work. Okay? Now, so what you do for that? You need Putty. You install Git, then you create a GitHub account for you. I, I expect to receive all your GitHub accounts as soon as possible. Due date is Monday. Okay? Then you set up your GitHub profile, okay? Killer cat, mass murderer. These are not good usernames. 
Okay? Git is something that stay, stays with you for the rest of your life. You are going to be CEOs or companies one day. You don't want people to Google your name and cat killer to come up. Okay? So I'm serious. Git is something that stays with you. So create your profile. Put your real name in there. Really edit your profile. Write what you have in there. Because when you give your resume to some place, do you know what is the first thing they do? Anybody knows? Google your name. And guess what comes up? GitHub. As soon as they see you have a GitHub account, poof, that's a green light. It means hire this guy. This guy knows how to code and collaborate. Because that's what you need in a workplace. And that's what I'm trying to make you learn. I'm not teaching you. And I'm only asking you to learn about, I think, four or five commands. Pull, push, download, upload, pull, push, clone, commit. No! Oh, fork schmark. OK. No. That's it. These four. OK? Just work with Git in a very basic way. If there is a conflict, I'll give you an awful way to fix it. I'll tell you what a conflict is. I'll, we'll explain when we come, come through it. Uh, so, but, but you have to do this. Anyways, install all these things. <clears throat> And if you have Windows, so down to this point, you do all these things. If you have Windows, you install Tortoise Git. Tortoise Git is a shell integration for Git that allows you to do all the Git commands using your mouse. OK? It's a good way of learning. And later on, you'll find that you can find out how I can do a command line to do this. OK? The commands are not, lines are not very difficult. But I want you to, I think, a week of your time to learn this thing will gain so many weeks in your life that is worth it to do it. So, okay? So, uh, so yeah, so you, you install Tortoise Git over here. Then you're going to create an SSH key to connect to Git. What is an SSH key? SSH key is literally a key. Okay, I give the key of my house to you. Then you don't need to knock. You open and come in. So that's what you do with the SSH. So you install and you create an SSH key, you put the combination in, in GitHub, and you put the key on your computer. So anytime you connect to Git, you don't have to enter user ID and password anymore. It just negotiates. Oh, it's you? I know. You have a key. Come in. Done. That's how I do everything so quickly. So, and it is, ex it is explaining exactly how to do it. How to do it on Windows, and uh, uh, and if you are using a Mac, sorry, you have to do command line. I don't know any integration for Git on Mac, or you can use it Git's own shell. I don't know how it works. Uh, but command lines are pretty easy, too. That's, uh, that's why I'm using If you are having a Mac, I strongly suggest and get it from me as a friend. Install VMware Fusion. VMware Fusion. If you have a Mac that is not one of those M thingies that has a mobile CPU in it. If you have a Mac that is, has a real process, processor in it. Um, so install uh, VMware Fusion and install Windows on it. You need to learn Visual Studio to be able to do many things. Uh, many things that you need to do uh, work. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a very high percentage of people in, in the world, com companies in the world, use Visual Studio and Visual Studio Codex especially. So learn it. It's good for you. Uh, and in future, if you are doing game programming, if you are doing GPU programming, if you are doing parallel processing, stuff like that, you're going to need a Mac. Yeah, you're going to need a, a Visual Studio. OK? So be aware of that. That's that. And uh, install the Markdown Viewer, Markdown Viewer on Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Chrome. Everything is Chrome now. Firefox is Chrome, Edge is Chrome, Chrome is Chrome. They all have Chromium engine. So uh, install Markdown Viewer on your Chrome, Firefox, Edge, whatever you have. What is Markdown Viewer? 
all the web pages that you see on Git, all the code that you see that is written on Git is not HTML. It's something called Markdown. Okay, something that you can quickly write without knowing HTML. And um, your browser doesn't understand it if you download it on your computer. If you go on GitHub, you can see it because GitHub shows you, converts it to HTML when it shows it to you. But if you download it, when you clone it on your computer and you want to open the project on your computer to take a look at it offline, that's what the mark, this is the one actually, you see over here, it says Markdown, okay, Markdown Viewer. So like this, I can actually go to my, go to my, go to my, uh, say op244 thingy i can go to uh say uh notes that we have and i can double click on read me and this is what i see it actually shows you what exactly it what it, it looks like this is last semester's thing and these are all the recordings but it doesn't matter anyway yeah you follow what i'm saying right so do it that way yeah so you can actually look at all the stuff on your computer and you don't have to do it uh, uh, let me see what else. So uh, workshop zero, please do it as soon as possible. Did I close the thing? I think I closed it by mistake. Go back in here. Yeah, so workshop zero, do it. Uh, and again, install FusionWare. This is how to register license for personal use. And VMware is free. You can do it. Windows 10 is not. Uh, probably you have to uh, buy it or download the, uh, I don't know. Uh, you have to somehow, okay, I don't know. School used to provide it. I don't know if it does it still or not. But um, uh, investigate. But install Windows. The good thing about uh, those who have Mac, they know what boot camp is. Boot camp literally divides your computer by two which means it reduces the computer's uh, hard drive capacity by the amount of thing that you have. So you lose lots of your Mac. When you, but VMware is not like that. With VMware, it's a software. It, it expands the, the size of the file, virtual hard drive, as it, when it needs it. So you don't lose everything. And you can simply, when you shut it down, you have your Mac with full capacity. When you bring VMware up, you can say, use all the CPUs of my Mac, and you have a powerful computer of course, your Mac is going to suck at that moment, but it doesn't matter. You have, like, and in your VM where you don't install anything, you install just uh, maybe uh, Visual Studio and Putty Schmuddy Thingy, all the things that I put for Workshop Zero, and probably a Microsoft Teams or something. That's it. You don't have any, anything else. You can still minimize it and use everything that you have on your Mac. So, and, and to experience virtual machines, it's a beautiful thing. A virtual machine is essentially a computer in the belly of your computer. Okay? And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's that one. Uh, so as you see, the first recording for the other section is up already. So if I already su always suggest to go take a look at the other ones too, if you have time. Because depending on what students ask, different things are brought up in class. I don't teach by topics. I teach by feedback. So I know what the topics I'm teaching, but if somebody asks a question about something else, we answer. So um, it's a good idea to take uh, to uh, look at the lectures of the other classes. Again, office and everything are here. You click on it, it brings you to the office. And any questions? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? Nothing? We're good? Surprise, usually people say, well, there's one person who always asks, well, there you go, I found it. <laughs> so, where do you send it? so what you do, you set up your Git, it, it tells you over here, and after you have done it, you simply add me as a collaborator. And the good thing is that my user ID on GitHub is Farda. <laughs> because the, f the first person who did it was the first Farda who added the account on GitHub was me. So. Uh, it's just type far that and my name comes up. So you can just add me as a collaborator, okay? Um, and, and that's that. And, and you add me, and 
Another thing I want to tell you, I'm going to clone uh, a repository to show you how it works right now. Okay? I did it for the other class. I'm going to delete that re repository from my computer and clone it again. So, how Git works is like this. Git is a distributed application. What does it mean, distributed application? It means uh, the application can exist on many places at the same time. So, the Git that GitHub company has in their, on their servers, you have the exact same thing on your computer with all capabilities when you install Git. And it's surprisingly small. So what you do initially, you create a repository on GitHub. We call that upstream. You know, fish go upstream to, you know, that's upstream. It means where everything begins. You create a repository on Git, then you clone it on the Git on your computer. So you have two identical. When I say clone, it is literally cloned. They are identical beings. Okay? Then you start modifying your, your application, whatever it is, on your computer, and you commit, and you commit, and you commit 50 times, and then you push. One push sends all the changes upstream to GitHub. So they become synced. That's usually what happens when you are asking me. But I always say, keep committing and pushing all the time. Seriously. Going to washroom, commit, and write, going to washroom, commit. Seriously. Because you will remember, I did the thing I, the code was in a good state when I was going to the washroom. I came back, I screwed it up. So those, to, like, I don't know, Jane called. Commit, Jane called. I want to make sure that I, am, I know which state I'm in. So all these commits create turning points that you can come back to later on. Very useful, okay? And especially when I help you, I usually say, far that fixes, and I commit. So when you pull the changes, when I commit, you pull the changes, you bring all the changes to your computer, you simply click on far that's uh, commits, far that's fixes, and you see the difference between the two. I'll demonstrate. And you'll see that with Tortoise Git, it's very simple to do all these things. I, you can do it with a command line. There's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Because Git is open source, because Git is open source, its book is open source too. It is called the Git book, okay? That is actually teaches what Git does. I put the link in, uh, in the... Uh, uh, in your OP244, um, what should we call it, uh, My Seneca page. So if you go to the uh, uh, documentation and information about the class and course information, you go over there, you see it. You click on it, the open source book opens. If you read first two chapters, it's like 30, 40 pages, pages each. You do that, you know more than me. Okay, it's very simple. It's not difficult, I'm telling you. Okay? especially for those who are doing programming. I'm, I'm about to talk about this in IPC 144. They, they have no idea what programming is, most of them. So that's going to be challenging, but we'll see. Anyways. Okay, so uh, let's do it. So this is the repository that I had over there. So what I'm going to do first, I want to make sure that everything is updated. So I'm going to do a poll. Tortoise get pull. So it pulls the repository from the from upstream, from GitHub. And as you see, it's gonna tell me, oh, see, I had some changes. And so I brought the changes over here. Then I'm gonna do a push. You can always go git sync and do all these things in one thing, but I like to do it separate. And when I do push, probably it's gonna say it's updated. So everything is updated, right? Now, both sync, so uh, what I'll do over here, to demonstrate it for you, I'm going to say, delete. You never lose your code when you have Git, because you can always clone it again. Okay? And if you keep committing and pushing, you have no problem. You always have losing that memory stick, hard drive got fried, computer got destroyed, no problem. Okay? You always have your code available to you. So how do I actually do it? I'll go to the repository. 
and I'm logged into GitHub. So because I'm logged into GitHub, I actually see private repositories too, like the dev repository over here that we develop everything for the, for the course, and the archive, everything that, that, that you're not supposed to see, and me and other profs see, because we are logged in, these are all the profs that who have access to this. So um, I want to get this notes. I'm gonna, and this is public. Everybody can clone it. So I'll cl I click on it. Because I have installed the SSH key, I'm going to go with SSH. HTTPS needs user ID and password. Very difficult, painful. The best is to go with SSH. So you click over here. It copies the path. So when I ask you, give me the path of your repository, you can either copy this and give it to me, or you can simply copy the URL and give it to me. Doesn't make any difference. But this one, this is the SSH link, and it's important for me because uh, I want to clone it. So what I want to do, I'm going to come in here, I'm going to right click, and I'm going to say git clone. Because it's in the clipboard, automatically the URL is passed. The, not the URL, the, the, the SSH path is pasted in here. Now all I need to do is to say, OK. Because I have an SSH key on my computer, it's recognized on git, and therefore I'll have the repository cloned in here in two seconds. And the most important thing is this git ignore thingy in here. You see this git ignore? What git ignore is I'm telling to git what to ignore when you are uploading. Do I need executables? No. Do I need all these debug crap that I have over here? No. So all this stuff that Visual Studio temporary files that it adds to the system, I say ignore them. I don't want it to be uploaded to, to GitHub. That's why you don't have garbage in GitHub. And every now and then, I sync all the repositories. Then I delete my repository and clone again just, clean to, just to clean up my hard drive. Yes? Uh, it, I, in the instructions, I'm telling you how to do it. OK? But because you are cloning my, and I'm not, please do not download anymore, OK? You clone the notes. So when I put something new, you just pull. And don't change the public repository. If you want to change something in here, put it in your own private repository and practice over there. Because you cannot push things back. This is my repository, and it's read only to you. So put this one, and any time you wanted something new, you do a pull. It brings it in. Easy, OK? So now I want to write something over here and teach something in a class. So what I will do. I'm going to create a directory over here, and AA, so that's where your stuff are going to be in. Then we'll start Visual Studio. And three years later, it's starting over here. Create a new project. Please uh, do the following. The first few times that I create a solution, I do it. So you see how I do it, because I see many of you do stuff that are not supposed to happen. Uh, so create it like this always, in four-hour classes. So create a new project if you are creating a new project. If not, just click on the, the, the uh, files in your directory, and it opens up automatic. Empty projects, C++ Windows console. <laughs> always make sure that this is checked. Always. You are not writing a ginormous application for a Fortune 500 company. You are writing a loop that is supposed to print something five times. For that, you don't need five projects in a solution. Your project and solution are the same. So you say place solution and project in the same directory. Otherwise, it's going to create a pro directory and another directory in it, and you don't want that. Okay? Always check this. Clean, nice. Then go to the directory you want. Be organized. Don't create everything everywhere. Be organized. Select folder. Then name it something that you understand, not something gobbledygook. OK? Put something over there that you can refer back to. Approximately 20% of my time with students are wasted for them to find out where the latest code is. Yet, you don't have to have five different copies. Have one copy, let the git 
supervise the changes. You don't need to create five different versions. And later on, you learn you can even anyways, branch it, but I'm not going to. But anyway, so I'm going to say 01 in here. And this is January 10th. And that's how I named the product. So then, because I want to re you, you guys to see which one is for which lecture, that's what I do. So that's the name of the project I created. And a few years later, it is created. I add a source file. Uh, then I'll go include. Oh, it's a little too big. Uh, the other class that the objective off. So I had. Can you see it back there? Or make it bigger? Is good. Okay. So include. I O stream no header files no dot h. It is a header file, but no dot h is in C plus plus. Okay. Using namespace std. Why? Because the sky is high. For now, just follow the things. Okay, int main, return zero, no void in main. Okay, all right. Then insert to console output, hello, op244naa, and insert a new line afterwards into the console. Control F5 executes. Da -da -da -da. Three years later, it compiles. And we see hello op two four four NAA. Are we good with this? Now this important and difficult program was done. So I want you to have it on GitHub. All I need to do, oh, the fifth one. I remember it was five commands. I told pull, push, commit, and uh, uh, clone. But one of the most important one, add for uh, Git to actually supervise and take care of your files, you have to first add them. This directory is in my repository, but it's not under supervision of Git. To make this thing, to tell the Git that this is supposed to be looked by uh, with you, then you have to actually add it. So I'll add it. Add. And as you see, it only adds what I have. You know how much garbage I have in there now? The debug directory, all the executables. These are the only things that you need. Even the SLN is not needed. So you only need three files. Actually, these two files and your files, that's the only thing you need. You don't need anything else. So I put the SLN because at certain time, I actually uh, have few projects inside a solution, and that's what you need this SLN for. But you don't need that either. Anyways, I'm going to click on OK. And as soon as I do this, it's going to say committed. So I'm going to say commit. And in here, I'm going to say hello NAA. That's what I did. That's the one that I can come back to later on. OK? I'm going to click on commit. And immediately ask me, you want to push it? It means you want to send it to GitHub? I would say yes, upload. And done. Now everything is in, in GitHub. If we come to GitHub, I refresh. NA is there. And the latest submit was NAA, as you see. If you click over here, it's going to show you the diff. So if I do this, obviously, there was nothing, now there is something. There is nothing, now there is something. But if I change it, you'll see how it works. Anyways, so I click over here. These are the files. You click over here. This is the file that I have written. Okay, so anything I do in class is directly in GitHub. You don't need to take notes. Okay, you don't need to write the programs I write. You don't need to test it. Everything's there. You can go later on at home, clone the repository once, and then pull. You're going to get all the new stuff happening. And let's say somebody changes something, OK? So I can change it right over here, too, but I don't want to. So I'm going to go actually change it in here. 
So I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to say welcome to 2231 semester. And again, insert a new line. So I'm going to say hello op 244 naa go to new line, then insert welcome to yada yada semester and go to new line. So I added a new line, right? I run it. Does it work? Yes, it did perfectly. Now I have some changes made. I have to update what I had in the repository, correct? So what I do over here, now I don't need to add anything. It was a file that was already added. I just need to change, commit to changes. So I'm going to say Tordis git commit, and I'm going to say welcome. If I can type it, of course, I'm going to click on commit and push and OK. And now if you actually go to Git and you refresh, you'll see it's updated. And the update was welcome. If you click on welcome, now it actually shows you the changes. It was this before, it's this now. OK, so you can actually see exactly what changes were for this commit okay and that's what you do that's how i help you that's how you see and you can do that with tortoise git too i can come over here i can literally go to the main thing and i'm gonna say over here hey tortoise show me the logs okay and in this log it's gonna tell me these are the things that happened see this is hello a so for azz i did the same thing all the things that i had done over there are are uh, explain the exact. So I updated the README file. So I click over here and I'm going to click on README file. And it shows me exactly what I updated in the README file. You see, I actually added the link for the recording. You can see all the changes, exactly what happened. So if a new workshop is added or a change to a workshop, I'm going to say, oh, there was a bug in the workshop. I fixed it. Please pull the repository again. You pull the repository, you want to know what is changed? Go diff it. As simple as that. And for our case, that was welcome. If I actually double click over here, it shows the exact same thing that Tortoise showed, uh, that Git showed. As I told you, Git is Git anywhere. Your computer is capable to do exactly what GitHub is doing because you have the same engine here and you have cloned the repository. And this is how our help collaboration and learning is going to happen during this semester. I want all of you to create Workshop Zero, and if you have any problem doing it, talk to me, I'll help you. We have a lab coming up, right? So start doing it, bring your computers for lab in lab. If there is anything wrong, I'll help you fix it in the lab. Questions? Suggestions? Yes. No, we just the reflect that you have. You have a reflect reflect file that you're submitting. Yeah, you just write it over there. By the way, okay. you help me with this and that. Okay. And by the way, please, in your reflection, don't write the usual thing in this thing and go through the topics. I learned object orientation. I le don't do this. I want in your reflections to tell me I had difficulty doing this because you didn't cover that co topic. Or talk to me about your experience with that workshop so I can fix it. OK, don't just write standard stuff over there to get the mark for reflection or not to penalize, get penalized for Because reflections, I told you, right, they don't have a mark, but they have negative marks. So if you submit it, you don't get any mark. You should submit it. If you don't submit it, you lose 40 percent. OK, careful. OK, just, uh, yeah, I, I like to see what you're saying. And please, please, please don't write the story of lives in there, okay? I want, I want something because I have 80 students, 100 students. If I have to go through 100 articles every week, you know, it's like reading Lord of the Rings every week over and over again. So please, be discreet and, ex like, I'm not saying to, to uh, 
write only three words, but do not babble, okay? Just write exactly. And your comments in the code, please. I like to see comments in a code. You like to see comments in your old code, believe me. Um, but please, be to the point. Don't write too many things because it just becomes spam, okay? Um, five minutes break. We come back and we continue. <clears throat> so the reason behind me asking you to use Visual Studio, <clears throat> now we are doing kindergarten stuff. So using Visual Studio with this is very easy. Okay, you are not creating complicated things. So it is time to learn Visual Studio and how to work with it. When the time comes and you are doing parallel processing and, I don't know, game programming and GPU programming and stuff like that, the things become so complicated that you don't want at that time to have another problem to see how the heck I'm supposed to work with this software that I've never seen before, okay? So <clears throat> now that things are easy, you learn to work with Visual Studio, so later on you don't. If you are using Sublight, if you are using Xcode, if you are using <coughs> Sublime, <coughs> if you are using Xcode, if you are using Codelight, any type of IDE use is fine. If you're using Eclipse, I don't know, whatever makes you happy. The problem is that, um, yeah, anyways, just that's the reason I'm telling you to use Visual Studio. And uh, it is an amazing tool. Uh, it's probably one of the few things that Microsoft made, and it's one of the, it's, it's a beautiful thing, okay? And uh, you can even use uh, uh, Visual Code, Visual Studio Code, yeah. Anyways, <clears throat> so we want to, so I'm gonna spend like 15 minutes to kind of give you an introduction of, of object orientation for you to see what we want to do. Okay, what, what, is the, what, is the, uh, uh, what is our purpose here, okay? Um, it, you know what plus plus does in C, right? You don't know what plus plus does in C? If you say I plus plus, what does it do? It, it, what does it, it adds one, correct? That's why they call it C plus plus. C plus plus is C language, one feature added. That is object orientation, okay? So that's what it is. So C is a, 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 a C++ is a superset of C. Anything you have done in C 
works in C++. You, you can use even printf. Well, you don't. Well, anyways, <clears throat> what I'm saying is that you could. It's going to complain, give you lots of warnings, saying that this function is unsafe. What are you doing? We have C out. But, but you could. So why, why, why object orientation? Why, if C is a, such a powerful language that most of Linux is written with it, why do we need to have C++? What is it good for? Uh, so problem is our brains. This thing cannot handle complicated things unless you have some superpowers. Okay. Um, as soon as, because essentially with C, the best you can organize thing is to put them in functions and then call those functions in main and call some other functions in those functions and call some. So it's kind of like a tree. So this function calls that, that calls that, that calls that one. That calls, so therefore, you organize your code. And after a while, you get confused. What the heck has just happened? Because you have so many functions doing things that you don't know how to organize them. And that's why things get uh, uh, go out of hand, and you cannot implement uh, ginormous applications in. <clears throat> um, just compare the. I don't. You guys are too young. Like uh, the, one of the amazing thing of computer science is that uh, I I feel like I'm two thousand years old. I've been in this field for what thirty five years or something like that. And I, like, I have seen things that you don't even know. Nobody knows. Who knows over here was a punch card? OK, see, see like two people. Like, if I tell you what it is, you're going to go, ah. Oh. But <clears throat> yeah, it's essentially, yeah. For, anyway, so what I'm saying is that if you remember what programs looked like, like anybody have seen uh, the, the game Prince of Persia? OK. Prince of Persia, I pray, played with the original version a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I like to see, I like you to see the difference between the two. You'll see how far we came through. Okay? To be able to organize our thoughts, we should make our program act, make our language. be capable of simulating the real world. C does not simulate the real world. I'll explain to you why, and I give these examples all the time, and kind of this fits. Imagine it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and you're deep sleep, and you hear, wake up. And first you ignore it, then you hear, Wake up. And you open your eyes. You look around. No one's there. As you're looking around, you hear again, wake up. You turn on the light. You look around. Again, wake up. But nobody's there. What are you going to do? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pee in my pants. I know about you. <laughs> but, well, that, what happened? What was wrong with this scenario? What was incorrect in here that scared the bejesus out of you? <laughs> there was nobody saying it. You had a function with no owner. An action happened. Something happened without a person owning it. You, you feel a tap in the back, and you turn, nobody's there. And then you, another tap, and nobody's there. That's exactly what it is. You, something is calling a function. A function is being called with no owner. That's unnatural. That's what all the languages that are not object-oriented are. For example, if you want to read, play, Music, okay? A play of music in C language. You create a structure. With that structure, you are saying, uh, this is the name of the music. Uh, this is where the file is. This is where everything is, right? And you put the structure around. 
Then you create a function called play that receives the structure music and then plays it, correct? That's not how it is. A music should play itself. You should tell to that structure that is called music. You should say, music, play yourself. It's like me when I'm talking. Who's talking? Farda. When I start talking, there is no talk function for me to go into so I can talk. I have the capability of talking within me. So unlike C language where you create a structure with only specifications in it, in C++ I can actually put functions inside the structure. So the structure not only owns the specifications of what to be, but also the actions of what this thing needs to be doing. A car structure can move, can break, can steer left, steer right. A car knows how to move itself. You don't need to have a function called move, put the car in it so the car moves. That's real life. The difference between C and C++ is a dead human being and a live human being. A dead human being or a statue is C language. A full structure with all the specifications of the human being that does nothing. C++ gives action to that thing and actually brings it to life. That's object orientation, and that that's the first feature of object orientation that we need to understand. It's called encapsulation. Encapsulation, so for your program to be really an object-oriented program, you have to follow three, you have to implement three things in your program. Number one, and the most important one, encapsulation. Putting the data and behavior together inside an entity instead of creating the data and pass it to functions. Functions should not exist by themselves. They should always be members of something. All right? Encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together. By the way, those descriptions inside, <clears throat> variables inside the structure, from now on, a structure, we call it a class. Okay? Because we are saying encaps encapsulation, encapsulation are it within a class, we call a structure a class. A class is essentially, and it is a class. A structure in C++ is a class. A structure in C++ can contain functions in it. You can literally put functions in it. When you want to access a variable inside the class, inside the st uh, structure, you put the name of the structure dot, then you put the variable, right? It's the same thing. You can put the name of the structure dot and you put the function and call it. So therefore, you're going to create five instances of three different, uh, of uh, five different instances of the same structure and a function of first one and second one and third one and fourth one will do whatever the individual ones have to do. They have nothing to, the functions belong to them. So if I talk, I have my own tone of voice. And when a lady talks, she has her own tone of voice. When I talk, I have my own accent. When you talk, you have your own accent because that's our properties although the actions are talking. Because the talk is inside a class, the talk of this, each class uses its own stuff. Each variable of a class is global to its functions. So the function inside each class have access to all the stuff. Why? I can scratch my head. But if I scratch his head, probably I'm going to get a slap in the face, correct? Everyone have access to their own stuff, correct? Encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together. Those specifications, we call it attributes too. Attributes, right? And the functions inside uh, a class, we call them behaviors or methods. 
okay? Behavior or method. So putting the data and behavior together inside the class, inside the structure, encapsulation. Numero dos. Second one. You should be able to reuse a design. You should be able to reuse your design. If you have a bicycle and you want to create a motorcycle, you don't have to start from scratch. You go say, oh, bicycle? I stick an engine on it. There we go. You have a motorcycle. Done. You don't have to go through because it's essentially that. Although it's going to look very ugly, but it is, it's going to work. It's, it's, these days, you can see all the electric, motor, the electric bicycles they're called, you know, essentially motorcycles, but with electric engines, right? So that's what they are. So you don't need to redesign the whole thing. That's why you should be able to say, if I tell you, if, if somebody have never seen a motorcycle in their life, but they had a bicycle, they ask you, what the heck is a motorcycle? You simply say, motorcycle is a bicycle that has an engine. In two seconds, that person knows exactly what a motorcycle is. You don't need to explain anything else. They can imagine, oh, something that I don't have to pedal on it anymore. It just goes by itself. Two seconds. This is called inheritance. You can inherit all the specifications of one class and build a new class that is better and not code as much. If I am creating an employee class that has all the specifications, then I can simply create another class called professor. What is a professor? An employee that teaches. Done. Do I need to redefine how it gets salary? No. Do I need to redefine it? It has a name? No. Everything that an employee has, a professor has. It, but it teaches. So you don't have to reinvent everything. Therefore, programming becomes easy. You already have everything made for you. You just put the puzzles together and you create a new class that does amazing stuff just by already existing classes and their capabilities. This is called inheritance. So inheritance is not me being son of my father. Actually, my father and I are instances of same class. We are both human beings. If you believe in evolution, probably my dad and I are Neanderthals, something like that. I don't know. Whatever. So what I'm saying is that, uh, or mammals, we are mammals, something like that. We get all the specifications of mammals, something like that. So again, inheritance is to reuse design. And finally, <clears throat> we need to appreciate that same action in different classes may work differently. They accomplish the same thing, why they work differently. An airplane flies. A mosquito flies. They are both flying objects. Right? I'm just classifying it that way. A pigeon flies. A helicopter flies. Those drones that everybody has, they fly. But each one does the action of flying in a different way. So doing the same thing in a different way is called polymorphism, having many shapes. This polymorphism is the third thing that you need to have in your program. So your program is fully object-oriented. Done. Inheritance, encapsulation, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. You don't have these three in your application. Your application still is not an object-oriented program, and you cannot get the, all the benefits out of it. And we have one more thing that I need to mention that is very important is, for some reason, my watch thinks I'm weightlifting now. <laughs> That's why I laugh. It's like, good, good job. <laughs> it's like as if I'm weightlifting. Anyways, so next thing. This is not any, it has nothing to do with object orientation. It's something that is extremely important in, in programming. And it's called abstraction. Anybody knows what, uh, uh, anybody knows what is abstraction? No, that's programming. 
If you go to a, a, an art gallery and say, this is an abstract art, there is no thing that you said over there. What is abstract? Not class. What is abstract? I call that a prototype. So you're saying an abstract is a prototype. So let me, so all, you are all correct. You are mentioning abstraction in different types of things. Lovely, lovely. Less details. What does it mean, less, less details? See, you can never, ever, ever cover everything when you're explaining it. OK? Two guys talk, oh my god, I saw that girl. She was beautiful. And that's the only thing they talk about. Nothing else. The only importance was that that lady was beautiful. Two girls talk, oh, that boy was handsome. The only thing that is important for them at the moment is the handsomeness of the guy. Abstraction is to get from the thing you want, to get the features you want, and ignore the rest. Only focus on what business logic dictates to you. What is business logic, sir? Do you know what's business logic? When I say business logic, what does it mean? Anyone? Business logic? What does it mean, business logic? Business logic? Anyone? I'm not teaching only to you. <laughs> business logic? Anybody knows what is business? Oh, by the way, I forgot about that. I didn't do it today, but this is how I teach. I start from one side, and I'm going gonna, gonna to ask. If you think you're not going to answer, you simply say pass, and I'm going to go to the next victim. OK? So business logic, you know what it is? <laughs> <laughs> no, business logic. I didn't say purpose of a business. Anyone? You want to say that? <laughs> OK, business logic essentially means what client wants your program to do. Okay, that's business logic. Okay, so your abstraction leads you towards business logic. A bad programmer adds too many bells and whistles that are not needed. I'm going to say, I want a program that accepts somebody's, I want an application that accepts people's names and puts them in order so they can enter to a club. So I write an application. Then I'm going to add a beep to it. And whenever you add somebody's name, it says beep. And then you put 20 of those computers. And all you hear in that room is beep, 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 because people are under it. And it becomes crazy. That actually happened to me. I did that, actually. I did a ticket booking thingy that people would call and do a ticket. And whenever there was like the entry was happening, I added the beep. For me, it was cute, right? Oh my god, they're going to beep after it's done. And then they put 20 computers in a room. People got calls and start getting tickets. All you could hear in that lab was beep, 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 beep. And people would go nuts. Why? Because I did not do the abstraction. I did not do the thing I wanted and ignore the rest. What the heck is a beep? You follow? So remember that. That's the most important thing when you are programming. Have yourself a beautiful day. Oh, any questions? Suggestions? Uh, so there's technically no workshop for this. No workshops? Except workshop. The hardest workshop. He says no workshop. I want to shoot myself. Workshop zero this except, week. Except that. Yes, yes, yes. Workshop zero this week. That's the most important workshop.